Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. Welcome to one of the internet's best podcasts, where we dive deep into the lives of the extraordinary and fascinating people who leave an indelible mark on our world. Join us as we explore their captivating stories, remarkable achievements, and unique perspectives that shape history and inspire generations. Get ready to embark on a journey through the lives of inspiring people unlike any other. Hello, welcome to the show. My name is Avram Rosenzweig, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm delighted that you're here as well. We're uh, doing our 48th show this evening. And if you have wondered what the, the my podcast is all about, let me explain to you in simple terms is I really want to pat humankind on the back. I think that so much of what we do and what we have done over the last thousands of years or perhaps billions, uh, billions of years is, 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 is so special and so incredible and often gets lost in the anger or the destructive nature of humankind. What, what I like to do is to bring forward individuals who have inspiring stories and for us to listen to them very closely and to emulate them. Uh, when I speak about the successes of humankind, just, just let me mention a few of them. The moon landing. In 1969, in 1969, we landed on the moon and we have gone into space many times since. What a miraculous idea. What a miraculous reality. Uh, do you know that we've eradicated smallpox for all intents and purposes? It really was the first disease that uh, was eliminated by humankind. Uh, the Internet revolution, while there's a lot of crap on it, there's no question about that. The idea that I can walk on the streets of Toronto and flip open my phone and speak to my sister who lives in Jerusalem, that's what we used to see on Star Trek. And here it is a reality in, in, in our lives. Polio vaccination, International Space Station, Human uh, Genome Project, and it goes on and on and on. I think that if we, humankind, were able to recognize more so the vast treasures of which we have uncovered and created and developed, that to me that would lead to greater peace in the world. And I say that because when you recognize with inside of yourself the beauty, your generosity of spirit, you perk up. You become excited about life. You become excited about the world in which you live and the world which you share. So let's do that. Let's be inspired. And we will today by my guest, Linda Brenneman. Brenneman? Yeah. Did I say it right? Yes, you do. You got it right. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> now, Linda, firstly, thank you so much for being uh, with us. I really appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be on your show. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And I want to I want to thank our friend Harvey Brownstone. You were interviewed by Harvey? I was, yes, just a week ago. Uh, Harvey is internationally renowned for his interviews of great stars in the world, I guess of which you're one. You are a star. <laughs> it's, you're very kind and generous. I'm not sure I'm a star, but it was certainly an honor speaking with him. And Harvey uh, interviewed you. You must be a star. So oh, Harvey, call, he, Harvey called me up right afterwards. He's my mentor. He's a fine human being who has helped me enormously with my podcast. That's and he said, I th I, yeah, he's great. Uh, he said, I think you'd want uh, Linda on as a guest. I said, okay, let's do it. And I dealt with your publicist, Kim, her name. Kim, yes. Yeah. It was lovely, by the way. It's lovely. Yes. Nice. Very good at what she does. And uh, here we are today. So let's, let me just sort of give a preface to your story. You're, you're in your twenties. And as far as you're concerned, you and your six siblings, your mom, your dad are Catholics, right? Yeah. Yes. Then one day your sister goes to Montreal. She's studying to be a doctor, as many of your siblings have. And she's asking your, your uh, grandmother what was great-grandmother like. And her response was, just like every other Jewish mother. She goes, what? Just like every other Jewish mother? What are you talking about? Exactly. Oh, I, I, she must have taken a step back, Gr grandma did, no? I, I think my sister was sort of shocked into silence. And it was her godmother, and her godmother said, whoops, I thought you knew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> these are the great secrets that you let out, you know, unbeknownst to you that, ooh, I shouldn't be saying this. Exactly. But the phenomena here is that your father and mother were Hungarian. They have passed since. God bless their souls. And they uh, went through the war because they were born in the 20s. Um, and your father hid his Judaism. Yes. Yet you were able to uncover, some people might say exhume, through a tragedy in your, in your family, uh, a box full of documentation, which stated much of what you had become curious about. The trek, the journey to uncover the Jewishness of your father probably took about three decades. And, uh, but ultimately you did, and you wrote a book, uh, the Pulitzer saga. Yes. So how, how was it writing a book by the way, just the process? Well, you know, what was interesting is I never started out to write the book. I really, I started investigating my family and I worked with a Hungarian lawyer and sociologist who he himself was just brilliant. Um, and he uncovered things in places that you just, you know, most people couldn't do. <clears throat> so as he started finding this information, I needed to understand it. And I needed to understand the zygist of the times that these people lived because we were able to go back eight generations. We went, went back to the 1700s. Yeah. So I, and I have to say, as much as I, was went to great schools and was supposed to learn history. My history was awful. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I just did deep, a deep dive into whatever history I could find to try to understand the times. And I needed a way to organize it and sort of put it together. And in my head, try to connect with these people then and understand what they were doing and why they were doing it and, and, and what it was like. And so it, the book sort of just emerged, I will say. And it was a great way for me. I, After writing it, I felt like I was really connected to them. And that's what I wanted more than anything else. What's it like for you to be an author now? What does that feel like? Um, you know, it's still sort of new in my head. I, I'm not sure I call myself an author, though. I love it. And I love speaking about it. I, I've done... Um, you know, spoke in in person and on Zoom calls and interviews like this. And I, I just love speaking about them. And what's really been fun and interesting is as a result, I've had a lot of Pulitzers reach out to me and we're trying to figure out whether we're actually related because this was a huge family to begin with. So, so what, what what's fascinating about this whole thing is that your father was deeply, deeply private very much so very much so yet you seem the opposite of that would that be accurate <laughs> well it's so interesting that you say that because my father actually even though he was deeply deeply private he was um he was an extrovert he loved people and you know he was a physician and what he loved the most is teaching so he, he just loved his students and he loved teaching. I thought I was always an introvert and I didn't like speaking at all. But I think it's because of the subject matter. I just love speaking about it. So, so yeah. I mean, yet you're an entrepreneur. Uh, would you argue that entrepreneurs by definition are somewhat ex extroverted? I don't know. I think they're crazy. They're insane. You know? Do you feel yeah. that way about yourself? Are you? Like <laughs> you have to be highly optimistic, I think, <laughs> you know, and, and you have to sort of, you know, I, I don't know, maybe uh, be a little separated from reality. Like, can I really make this happen? So, yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you grew up in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, and then now you live outside uh, of uh, in Washington State. Uh, Washington you, DC. Washington DC. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're married, um, and you have a sort of a melded family. Your your husband had three kids, and you adopted two, sort of adopted two Afghani girls. Yes. Right. Yeah. So so you are very much part of the world. We call this in Hebrew, tikkun olam, which mm -hmm. is preparing the world. Are you familiar with it? Oh yes. Oh okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting, sort of going back to my my parents a little bit, and maybe it's the way I was raised, you know, my 
my mother just always said, you need to do what makes you happy. You need to do, use your God-given talents, but you need to make the world a better place. And I think both my parents really believe that in their hearts and live that and they passed it on to us. So, yeah. And, and your six siblings, are they like that as well? Yes. I think for the most part, um, three of them are doctors and I think they felt like they served through, through their, you know, through, um, taking care of people through medicine. And, um, the other three, I think also believe that. So they've done different things, but in their hearts, I think they all, we all try to make the world a better place. Well, good for you. I mean, what I find compelling about you as well, there's you and I have just met not five minutes ago. So this is always an exciting thing for me. As far as I'm concerned, you're a blank slate. And by the end of this interview, we're going to have this beautiful picture. Oh, thank you. That's Absolutely. so kind of you. So Absolutely. really kind of you. So what interests me as well is that you, you're you you're the middle of those seven <laughs> siblings. My sister Naomi was in the middle and she and my father <clears throat> used to sort of you know, have this uh, almost like an agreement that you, dad, you're the middle one. I'm the middle one. So we're all a little bit nuts. <laughs> and I think the reason for that is that you're not, you're not the youngest. You're not the oldest. You're kind of out there on your own. Do, do you think that's how you grew up? I do, because I think for the three older ones, it was almost as if they had their own family. Then there was me. And then the three younger ones, were their own family. And I was sort of in the middle, you know, part of each group, but not part of each group. Right. Right. So yeah. Yeah. And, like, there's something about it, especially when it's a big family. Oh, you know something, I'm the youngest of five. Ah, uh, oh, so. So when I get together with my sisters, I do act a bit like a little boy. I do. <laughs> it's fun. No. It, it, it is fun. So it doesn't matter let, what age you are. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so let's dive. Let's dive into your uh, your story, your parents' story. Your, your your mom and dad were both born in Hungary. Yes. And they met there. Yeah. Now, the war in, in the Second World War really started to affect Hungary. Uh, 1943, 44, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they were late late into the war. Yes, they were late into the war, yet the destruction with the Nazis caused in Hungary was absolutely devastating, right? Yes. So your father, tell us where he found himself and your mother when the war broke out. What were they experiencing at that time? Well, in 1942, they were 18 years old and they had just started medical school. So at that point in 1943, Three. No, I, I'm sorry. 1944 is when um, things really started to change in March of 44, primarily. Um, and then, so in March of 44, and but back, let me back up a little bit. First of all, even before that, the new the um, Jewish laws had started to get put be put into place starting in like 1938. So. Only six percent of the population in were allowed to be doctors, lawyers, go to school, and so on. So about two hundred fifty thousand Jews lost their jobs. It was awful, even starting before um, the Germans came in. So in forty two, my father was really. It was a surprise that he got into medical school at all. And I think it's because the family were able to pull a lot of strings to get him into school. So 42, my parents met in medical school. My father was instantly smitten with my mother and pursued her to the end. Yeah. Um, but in 19, um, in 1944, when the Germans came in in March, then in April, everyone had to you know, wear the yellow star. They had their, everything was so restricted. I mean, my parents loved to go hiking and my father wasn't allowed to go hiking. He wasn't allowed to be in public parks. He wasn't allowed to go to the movies. Um, so you, I can imagine that their world just sort of shrank. 
But um, then in May of 42, 44, my father was called up to a Nazi labor camp and had to do hard labor in a camp, um, both basically in the Carpathian Mountains, which are incredible mountains. Um, and I think they were mostly logging um, and carrying these huge trees to, um, to I guess, the local railroad station where then they would be transported. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at that same time, sort of shortly after my father left, and, and the day before he left, by the way, he proposed to my mother. Mm-hmm. So, so they were now officially engaged. Um, Muzzle tough. Yes. And, and then my mother, um, shortly after he left, my, my mother's closest childhood friend was uh, someone named Eva Fisher at the time. Now she's Eva Klein. Um, actually came to her and asked her if she would move into a factory complex. And the factory complex was owned by a friend of her boyfriend. Her boyfriend at the time was a rabbi. And um, he and his factory had to be shuttered because of the Jewish laws, the anti-Jewish laws. So she asked my mom if she would move into a factory complex and hide her, her family, her rabbi, um, her rabbi's family, the um, factory owner's family, and they were hiding a lot of um, Jewish students and and others. We don't really don't know how many people, but um, yeah. So she and her family moved into this factory complex and and hid people, and and for that she was honored later on in two thousand six as righteous among the nations. By Yad Vashem, yeah. your mother your mother was Catholic. Why did she do that? Well, her best friend was was uh, was Jewish. Ava was Jewish, and they were very close. And she was not going to let anything happen to Ava's family, and and of course my father's family. I didn't find out until much later that she also hid my grandmother and my father after he escaped from labor camp. Do, do you so, understand the psyche of the the righteous among the nations? There are very few people who actually put their lives at risk to save Jews. Well, you know, what's interesting. Um, when my mother was awarded righteous among the nations in 2006, she was already suffering from Alzheimer's. She mm. was not in good shape. And so we don't really know how much <clears throat> she really understood about it. My father actually gave her acceptance speech and so on. But after all, after the ceremony itself, there were lots of reporters hovering around her, and one of the reporters asked her, he, he said, how did you have the courage to, to hide people? How did you have the courage to risk your own life? And she answered, and, and very strong. I mean, I, I remember this so clearly. She said, I did what any other decent human being would do. And, you know, I, I mean, even in her Alzheimer's, she, that was my mother. She was she believed in humanity and she was not going to risk anyone's life. She was going to defy injustice. She always was like that. She just, you know, was believed in, in humanity. Were her, her parents empathetic people? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, she did not get along with her either parents. Mm -hmm. She was, um, they had a very complicated story themselves, very complicated. She actually was born in Rome and came to, and they were Hungarian, so she wasn't Italian. She, but uh, she lived in Italy up until she was 10. And then she came to, to Hungary to live with her grandmother. Um, and later her parents came, but she never really got along with her parents that well. And my and her mother actually came to the states and lived with us, but she was a, a very bitter person. So um, I don't I don't think she got that from her parents. I think think that somehow that was innate in my mother, but I don't think it came from her parents. Did you get that from your mom? Yeah, I think so. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. You know, I I think um, I believe in just. Um, 
you know, if there's an injustice, I, you know, I'll stand up against it. So, so your father's in this labor camp and the way he tells the story, uh, almost like a Hogan's hero escape, right? Well, that's for the second one. So I, the, the, I think the point is that your father was prone to hyperbole. Oh, very much so. Very <laughs> much so. He <laughs> never, ever talked about the first labor camp. Never. Mm -hmm. And, and it was after the Russians came in. So in 1945, the Russians came in and it was still pretty horrible. But what happened was there was no food. And my father and the rabbi and, and uh, I think three others um, went out to look for food, basically. And the Russians captured them. And the Russians, what was happening is the Russians had a quota. They had to capture so many Germans, right? They were trying to capture the Nazis. And they, they hadn't feel, fulfilled their quota. So they got my father and his, um, I think there was four other, four or five other friends. Um, and one of them, unfortunately, which had been a childhood friend of my father's, was, was shot by the Russians. He tried to escape and they shot him. But when they got to this Russian camp, um, they were able, they were able to escape they were able to communicate with a Russian and let them know that they weren't Germans specifically because one of the Russians understood Yiddish and the rabbi started talking, speaking Yiddish. Amongst other languages. Right. Oh, they were trying all sorts of different languages because, you know, my father knew like seven languages, but he didn't know Russian. So they were trying all the languages. And then this rabbi tried Yiddish and and a, one of the Russian soldiers knew Yiddish. So that's how they were able to communicate. But the way my father told the story, he, he told it like a Hogan's hero um, episode, you know, where he, where the, where the camp commandment was, commander was actually letting them go because he got the other um, soldiers drunk or something in it. That wasn't the way it was <laughs> at so all. Ultimately then he, he, he makes his way back, right? Yeah, well, he made his way. They told him, they told him to go to Seged, which is a town about two hours or so south of Budapest because uh, the fighting had stopped there and the medical school was opening up. So he went to Seged and, um, and, and started medical school, believe it or not. I mean, that was his big thing is he wanted to get back to studying and somehow he got, um, oh, the rabbi actually didn't want to stay in Seged, wanted to go back to Budapest. And when the rabbi went back, he said, oh, you know, uh, Julian is there. And um, so Clara and Ava hitchhiked to Seged, which is its own remarkable story, which wasn't, wasn't in the book, but <laughs> lots of details about that. So it was... Um, you know what's phenomenal? Oh, what's phenomenal about that, Linda? Just the pieces that we've approached so far it, it, it is everybody has a story to tell, right? Absolutely. And this story, which you're telling, is so rich and so complex and so daring and so loving and beautiful. You mentioned before that your your father was was smitten by your mother. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> she she was smitten by him, and they wanted to get back together. Absolutely. It was a true love affair. Well, what did he adore about your mom? You know, that's a good question. I think, you know, it's it's interesting because it's hard for, for a, a daughter, I think, to understand that. But yeah. um, I was talking to a friend, uh, a friend of theirs who was had been in medical school with them in in both Budapest and Sagan. And um, and he said what he said was that Ava, her friend, was absolutely beautiful and very interesting looking. And my mother was very beautiful too. And it's sort of hard for me to, you know, say, yes, my mother was beautiful, but, but I think she was beautiful, but also she was really smart. She was incredibly smart and <clears throat> she was very humble. And um, Ava told me that before she met my father, she was very, very, very shy but when she when she met my father, she just blossomed. 
Mm. So she, you know, she was a very, and she, I, I, you know, she was clearly a very strong person. She had such inner strength and she was so loving and strong and she would fight for what she believed in. Was she a good mom? She was a great mom. Yeah, how so? Really, she really supported us no matter what we wanted to do. Um, she was always supportive and encouraging. And, you know, as I had said before, she said she'd always told us, you know, you can do whatever you want. Just use your God-given talents. And back then, people didn't really say that. No, you know, no. now now maybe they do, but back then they didn't. You're 100% right. You know, I'm of the artistic band and um, I've been a writer and I've been a podcaster. I've done all kinds of radio. And early on when I was trying to find myself, I had people telling me, well, why don't you become a travel agent? <laughs> I uh, what? <laughs> that was way back, you know, 20, 30 years ago. You did what you had to, not what you wanted to what do. What you wanted to do, right? Linda, what, what, what was your dad like in terms of a father? Well, he, everyone needed to go to medical school. According to him, you know, being a physician was the greatest thing in the world, especially going into research to try to, you know, um, you know, find new ways to cure the world. That was his way to serve humanity. And he believed in it so strongly. Um, and so he wanted us all to be like that, to, to be doctors and so on. And, and he, I mean, he was a great dad. I know he loved us, but he was, he couldn't say it. Mm -hmm. He could, he, I never heard him say, I love you in all the years. Even till the day he died. Even till the day he died. You, and, you, you know, in, in the last few years, I used to call him uh, weekly. We'd have a weekly talk because by that time I was starting to look into my family history. And so I would call him and we'd have these hour long talks and I'd at pepper him with questions. He never, ever would talk about um, his, his being Jewish. He never admitted it to his dying day. And um, and he could never say, I love you. And I would, I was always say, you know, bye, dad, I love you. And he couldn't, he couldn't say it back. You say it to your kids? Pardon? You say, I love you to your kids? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All the time. Do they as say, much I as I can. <laughs> as much as you can. Do they say they love you? Oh, yes. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, okay. yeah. You, you broke that chain. Good for you. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something. I know that your great grandfather signed a card in the early 1900s, uh, changing his name, changing his status. Uh, really converting to Christianity, really, and and but it, on the card, strangely, it said, "But I I I am I, an act not an acting Jew, but I still can be seen as a Jew." Something like that. So the fact of the matter is, converting to Christianity didn't mean very much to the Nazis, right? Meant nothing to them. But I also don't think he did it out of any other um, any other reason than he was trying to support his family back then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, first of all, he changed his name back in um, 1912, I think it was, it was even before World War One. And the reason to change his name, I don't think had anything to do with his Jewishness. I think it had to do with Hungary at the time. So Hungary was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And what they were trying to do was to um, Hungary wanted their independence. And so they were trying to prove that the majority of the population was Hungarian. So they actually encouraged people to change their names into Hungarian names. And so it was more out of patriotism for Hungary than anything to do with religion. And then I think when he converted, he converted in 1938 which was, you know, I think he did that because he felt he needed to try to keep his his legal clients and and so on. And so he he felt that that was the best way to protect his family and to um, and to keep his clients and keep food on the table. So from your research, you know, we talked about your dad when he was 18 and the war was breaking out. He met your mom in medical school. Was there anything whatsoever personally Jewish about your dad? Did you ever see any aspect of him at all that you sense, well, that's Jewish? 
Well, you know, what's, what was interesting is when my niece got married, um, and I, I think it was 2011, maybe, or no, I'm sorry, it was 2008 when she got married, and she got married to um, a Jewish man, and they asked my father to give a little speech, and he gave it in Hebrew. You Perfect said. Hebrew. Really? Perfect Hebrew, yeah. And, but my father, it's amazing. People came up to him and said, wow, where did you learn Hebrew? Um, and he, and my father was just a master deflector. And his, he said, oh, I'm really good at languages. I also know Swahili. Is so, that what he said? Yeah, that's exactly what he said. So he was just, he was such a master deflector. But I also believe, you know, I, I do believe that he never lost that. And it was interesting, even after, um, after my mom had died and, you know, our, uh, their house had almost burned down. And um, my sister came um, over to check it on, check up on him. And it was the anniversary of my mom's death. And he had lit a candle for, for her hmm. and, you know, in the Jewish tradition. And so I think he did a lot of things, but he didn't let us know about them. He did them in secret. So when you were growing up, again, he was highly secretive about his Jewishness. Looking back on it, was there anything uh, Jewish within the household? Is there anything Jewish about you? Um, I think there's a lot of things that are Jewish. And I think it's sort of this, I think it's more of the values than anything else. And this this service to humanity that, that it's really important to serve humanity and to try to make the world a better place. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the biggest thing. So you have this house fire, right? And mm -hmm. you, had, you, you had already gleaned this information that your father was Jewish, but you sat on it for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for a couple of decades, actually. Yeah. And then the, the, the house fire happens, and your mom is injured. Um, your father only a little bit. She lives for another couple of weeks. She was in a coma. In two weeks, yeah. 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 Anyways, there's this box that crops up. And one of your sisters fine and it has all this documentation in it which start to answer the questions that you had already been asking right to tell us about this very interesting adventure well you know what it, it was interesting because when i first got the box you know it was i open it up and it's you can tell it hadn't been open for decades it was like you know this this um, horrible smell coming at you. Like yeah, you said attic. it smelled like an old attic. An, an old attic. Um, but then I, I start to go through it, and it's really old documents that that are you know paper thin and look you know I was scared to pick them up because I thought they'd fall apart. Um, and old photographs and and letters. And the problem was they were all in Hungarian, and I don't speak Hungarian, nor can I read it or write it. So. And it's a really tough language. I first start started to go through uh, Google Translate and Microsoft Translate, all those, tra and it doesn't work for Hungarian. It's Hungarian's a tough language. So, um, so I knew I needed to find somebody, and I was looking and looking, and uh, finally, um, a friend of a friend introduced me to somebody who lives about a half an hour away from here. Um, and she was an absolute dynamo. Um, and she, you know, she's Hungarian, she's Jewish. She looked at these papers and I, I, I swear I could have spent two days at her house. And I, you know, after spending like six hours, I, I had to leave, but, um, she was remarkable. And we started to go through some of the documents and she said to me, she said, these are really important documents and you really need to have this researched properly. So she introduced me to a number of different people, including people at the like the Holocaust Museum here and, and other Holocaust museums overseas. But she introduced me to Andras Gazitsky, who I ended up working with. And he, I will tell you, he was just, first of all, he was brilliant. And he became just such a close confidant, I will say, and 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 a real, just a treasured person. Um, He'd been a lawyer and he was a lawyer and a sociologist. 
And he'd actually been in government in high places in government. And he had um, been asked early on by Orban to be part of his government and he refused. And he had been blackballed for eight years. Uh, I want to add that the process of dedicating one's book is highly intimate. Yes. And the, you, you dedicated this to Andres. Yeah. Uh, 1958 to 2020, he died young. And you said, forever grateful for his intelligence, persistence, generosity of spirit, and for being a friend you could trust in an uncertain journey. I miss him every day. I do. Well, you guys must be. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but just the idea that you you dedicated the book to him. One would have thought you dedicated your father, right, or your mom. <laughs> she did to Andres. Yeah, he was a special person. He was a really special person, yeah, yeah. and I could not have found any of this without him. And he was somebody who was so committed to the truth, which is, I think, what I needed more than anything else. Having been you know, lied to and lied to for a good reason for my parents, but I just needed the truth and he was committed to the truth. And so when he would find something out, he would to try to check it three or four different ways to make sure that this was real. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it, it, we just developed one of these, I think really remarkable friendships, That's truly lovely. trust trusted partner in this journey. Did you have to fight the inclination to lie to people whom you loved later on in life because you had been living in a household like that? Or were you just always a truthful person? I, I'm all I'm I'm like the bull in the china shop. I'm like, <laughs> you know, this is the truth. Let's not let's just deal with the truth and not cover it up because I don't know, it's just the way I am. <laughs> so you're not a liar. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so you, you go through this documentation. What were the salient pieces that you uncovered? Oh, my God, there was so much. There was just so much. And I think the biggest thing that we found was this book that was written by um, a great, great uncle, um, Sigmund Pulitzer. And he told the story um, going back eight generations. And that was just remarkable to me. And, you know, the kinds of stories that were, you know, what I found were these people who had faced such cataclysmic events yes. and personally been, been, you know, they, they risked their lives too. Each one of them risked their lives. And, and they were so steadfast in their faith. And it's their faith that allowed them to carry on, to be resilient, and to also be, they had such loving and generosity of spirit. It's amazing. How did you see that generosity of spirit? I'm sorry, didn't hear you say that? How did you see that generosity of spirit? How did you read that? Oh my God, every every one of these people, like, um, I'll just give you an example. Um, Rachel, going back to the 1700s, she was this remarkable person, and at a very, very young age, she had her, her parents left for America. She was, so she was basically orphaned and her case that she was supposed to convert to, um, to um, Catholicism because her parents had converted and by imperial law, she was supposed to convert at the time. So she didn't want to convert. She wanted to be Jewish. So, her case rose up to the emperor wow. and the emperor, it was Emperor Francis II of the Austro-Hungarian empire. Well, what a story. It's amazing. And she had to go through a line. I think of, think of this girl. She's probably like 13 or 14 years old. She has to go through a line of Christians on the left and, or maybe on the right. I don't remember which was which. And Jews on the on the other side. Wow. And at the end of the line, then she had to choose which way she was going to go. And she chose Judaism. And the rabbi said to her, and I, I cried when I first read this. Rabbi said to her, 
you will, all of your descendants will be good and happy people. Oh, really? <laughs> so that was wonderful. But when you think about it, I mean, it was a nice sentiment, but it did not protect her from, from just incredible tragedy. Her, her husband, she ended up marrying Moritz Pulitzer and who was a very successful doctor in his day. Um, and he was murdered by Napoleon's soldiers. So she was left a widow and, and had a very hard life. Okay, so. can, I, can I ask you a question? It, it seems like you have some Christianity in you. It seems like you have some Judaism in you. Are you constantly leaning one way or another for one of those pieces? <laughs> to, that's, that's a Charlie Brown cartoon, by the way. Lucy came up to Charlie Brown and Charlie Brown says, you know, there's half of me that feels really good. And there's half of me that doesn't feel so good about myself. She says, well, Charlie, just lean one way and the bad will pour into the good. So, <laughs> is, is, there, is there something inside of you, like an ongoing battle between that Christianity in your past and then <laughs> your dad's Jewish? You know, Sunday, I'll be honest with you. Religion hasn't played a big part of my life. And I, I think I'm very spiritual. I believe in a, in a good God. Yeah. And, um, and I think my father was like this too, even though he never talked about it. I think he, he had a lot of faith and I don't think it mattered to him if it was a Christian God or a Jewish God. Uh, it's just, we're sort of all one, one people. And yeah. So uh, with your Catholic background, I mean, the, the, the Catholic church, um, the Pope, the Vatican were not helpful, let's say, during the Second World War. Quite the opposite. Do you feel any guilt about that? Well, I don't feel guilt, but I feel horrified that mm. that they treated people that way, that they could turn their backs on people. Yes. As a matter of fact, you know, when, when Hungary started putting in all those anti-Jewish laws, the um, the the I, I don't think it was maybe the priests, well, some priests, but the bishops certainly we're all in favor of that until the one Jewish law that forbid marriage between Jews and non-Jews. Because at the time, at, there was a period before where Hungary was very assimilated. Jews were very assimilated in Hungary. And so there were a lot of intermarriages. Yes. And, and so then the Catholic Church was going to lose a lot of quite frankly, wealthy donors because of that. And that's the only time that they objected. So I don't think it had anything to do with religion and caring for people. I think it had to do solely with money. And that to me is horrifying. So if someone says to you, Linda, what are you? You know, the, um, the inference being, what is your background? What is, what, how do you live? What a religion do you come from? What would be your response? You know, I, I was raised Catholic. But I have a I have Jewish ancestors, and I am so proud of them. I am I, I can't tell you how proud I am of of them. And and I'll give you an example. I'll give you a great example. My great great grandfather was um, you know he was a very successful lawyer. He was he was founder of the Budapest Bar. He was a big philanthropist, and he was an ardent Hungarian patriot. He loved Hungary, yes. and he. Um, he, he, as I said, he was a big philanthropist, very active in the Jewish church. So in 1944, yes, in June of 1944, he basically, well, even before that, in 1938, he lost, he had, they had a huge farm outside of Budapest that he lost. In 1944, June of 1944, all Jews had to leave their homes and they were, um, they, they, and actually, he had a he had built a home in nineteen in eighteen eighty eight on sort of the Grand uh, Boulevard in Budapest. It was a huge home. It had a lot of apartments that were all family members. Everyone had to leave their home, leave the house, move into one room in the Yellow Star house. And these were houses. They were unique to Budapest, actually, in the Holocaust, but. They were essentially, um, they would be marked with the yellow star and they were actually um, preparing Jews for deportation is what they were doing. So he writes to Governor Horthy 
and asks for exemption from these restrictions and wants to go back into his house. And he actually got a letter approving that, but by that time it was too late because the Germans had taken over. And so when he got the exemption, he got an exemption from all the Jewish restrictions and he refused to take the yellow star off. And he said, I wear my Judaism with pride. And that was him. And that I, th I think that was sort of, you know, um, inherited, I will say. So this whole journey, which your father never really wanted to hear about, you never spoke to him about it. He didn't want to talk, he wouldn't about, talk it. about it. He wouldn't go there. No, right to his dying day. Right. How would you say that it, it <clears throat> excuse me, that it helped you evolve as a human being? My father's secrets or no, no, this, this trek that you went on. This to journey. Discuss, yeah. This journey. Well, you know something I think, first of all, it helped in, in many respects. I think, I think part of it was when you don't know your roots, it, it's just, it, it leaves you, you know, sort of like this, like, do I really belong here? I, you know, I didn't, ha I felt like I didn't have roots. I knew my grandmothers, but I didn't really know anything about any of my other ancestors. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a famous quote, and I'm going to get it wrong. There's a famous quote by Goethe, who is the, you know, German, famous German philosopher. And he says um, something about the best thing that parents can give is roots and then wings. You know, wing, and and I don't think you can have the wings without the roots. And I think that's what this gave me. This gave me roots. And as, I think, as well as the wings. And yeah, I think as well as the wings because I think also, you know, I was I was angry with my father. I, I you know was quite angry, and I don't think I, I, I don't think I knew I was angry, but I was angry, and I think by understanding the stories and understanding more of what he faced, I I can forgive him, and I I you know I don't judge him anymore. I really don't. You know, he it was. I think he kept the secrets because when he came to the States, the States were just as anti-Semitic, yeah. you know, they weren't, they were just as bad. And I think he had left all this horror and he was starting a family. And I think he, he wanted to protect his children. Did he have a, did he have a bar mitzvah, your father? You know, I, that's the one thing I couldn't find out, but I will bet he want, he did because both his father and his grandfather were were very active in the Jewish community, so I I would bet he had he did. You but, know, Linda, as as a Jew, my, you know, my father was a rabbi, mm. and I went to uh, Talmud school. Mm -hmm. And and although I'm not religious anymore, um, if you ask me, Avram, who are you? The number one or two or three would be I'm a Jew. <laughs> so I live it, I breathe it, right? Right. It's extremely difficult for me to understand how uh, a person can dismiss their Judaism, not in a, not in a judgmental, critical way, but I just I'm like my Judaism is so beautiful, and it's given me wings, and I'm trying to understand why it never, even near the end of your father's life, never gave him wings. Yeah, I think he was, I think he had built up this story when he, you know, having lived through those horrors, I think he had built up this story and he just couldn't, yeah. couldn't break it. And, and the beauty of your mom, Clara, was that she never imposed upon him, you know, honey, we, we got to come up out with this. Never, ever. She allowed right. him his secrets. Right. And think about what that did to her. She never, you know, here she was honored as righteous among the nations. Yeah. She never talked about that, and you know, until I will say in in two, in 1990, I went to Hungary with her, and at that point, I had just learned that I was Jewish. I learned three years before, and I asked her all these questions, and she told me little things, but you know, not not the full truth, and. 
she had said, like, really, at one point, she said, oh, I hit a few people. And that's all she said. And at the time, I didn't have enough history to really, you know, ask her, what did that really mean? And and then all of a sudden, in 2006, we get this invitation from the, you know, Israeli consulate yeah. to, wow. for her ceremony. It was wow. amazing. You have a lot to be proud of. By the way, as you can see throughout this entire interview, I've been pushing you to say that you're a Jew. <laughs> 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 and then like a minute ago, do you notice what you said? You said I, and then I found out that I was a Jew. I was Jewish. Now, was that Freudian or was that a slip or what? And I've been pushing you, Linda. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> has has uh, in, in this whole sort of trek and journey, which is really a splendid, splendid uh, uh, journey that you you've been on. At the end of it, now here we are today on, on June the 11th, where there is an awful lot of anti-Semitism in the world. And there's an awful lot of things going on in Israel and Gaza. Let me ask you, do, do you have any sense why the Jewish people are hated so much? I wish I, I, wish I could answer that question. I mean, it's a no. I have no understanding of it at all. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. We're just all people. And I go back to actually the way we were brought up. My mother brought us up. And my mother always said, it doesn't matter what your race is, your ethnicity, your the color of your skin, the you know your sexual orientation, your economic status, it doesn't matter. We're all human beings. And we all need to be treated with respect and dignity and compassion. And that's how we were brought up. And so, I don't know, it's just completely foreign to me. I, I don't understand it. Have you seen anti-Semitism where you're at in life? Um, you know, I don't think so. Not outwardly. But um, but I do feel the fear. I And, you know, I, I feel especially as I've been speaking and, and interacting with a lot of people. And I will tell you, I've had a lot of, um, uh, I was supposed to do a lot of book talks and they've been canceled because of fear of, you know, and it's just, it's unbelievable to me, to me right now, it's more important for, than ever for me to speak because we are just all people and, that's we, we need to carry this message that they were, they were canceled by the sponsors, yeah. the hosts. Yeah. Not not by you. No, not by me. Not by me. And that's as I said, I, I think it's more important than ever that we have these conversations. That fear that you're feeling, a fear of what? And I'm not feeling it. I'm I, I'm not feeling the fear. I think I I think I'm ready to I like the bull in the china shop. Oh, okay. I'm ready to get out and speak, but I think others are really afraid of having gatherings um, and that, that there could be violence. When I said at the top of the show that uh, this is all about inspiring others, um, I think that you've done a, a, a beautiful job of that, Linda. Oh, thank you. Thank I, you. I, I say that because, um, firstly, you saw a challenge in front of you, uh, which was a very deep one. You know, all of a sudden you find out that your father's a Jew I've often asked Jewish people, what would happen if one day you woke up and you found that you weren't Jewish? And <laughs> one can only imagine what goes on in people's heads when they discover, my God, I'm a Jew, you know, or, or my father's a Jew, however you want to qualify. And then you set about investigating it, you know, you're sleuthing. You, you started <laughs> sleuthing with your friend Andros and you wrote a book about it. I mean, that's magnificent. It really is. Thank well done. You. Well Thank done. you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, is your family proud of you? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I, you know, I, I honest, I, I think my mom and dad are, are looking down and nice. I think they are. I think they are. Like your dad has no secrets in heaven, does he? No, absolutely not. And you know what? I think, I think he'd actually be happy that these secrets are, are, you know, are now open out, out in the open. Oh, he has wings now. Yeah. Before we part, uh, I'm just very curious. I'm a curious man. T tell us about your Afghan daughters. Oh, my God. They are so wonderful. It has been 
such a gift to us, I think. You know, after um, after they graduated college, from college, they came here on a program through a, a program called SOLA, and it was SOLA stands for School of Leadership Afghanistan, and it was a um, it was an organization that was founded by my husband's uh, college roommate. Nice. And and now it's taken over by an Afghan girl called Shabana. And and a lot of the students now have are actually they're carrying on school in Rwanda because they can't in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Um, but at any rate, uh, they came here after college. And so we um, we helped them get asylum and and help them to sort of study and one went to medical school, the other went and just graduated from law school. So we are so proud of them. How did they get along with your other three? Oh, great. Yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a very rich life then. Oh, yes. Good Absolutely. For Absolutely. Yeah, good for you. Did you ever get lonely or feel like I'm bored? No. <laughs> Never, right? No, that's one thing I don't. <laughs> that's lovely. That's beautiful. Are you a cook? Um, I used to be. I'm. I'm. I'm not. Not so much anymore. I'm. You know, as I get older, I say, oh, let's let's order out. <laughs> do you do you sing at all? I wish I have a terrible voice, but do you have a have do you have any poems or prose uh, that you've memorized about the beauty of life? <clears throat> excuse me, about being free. I like to ask my guests to finish off on something that they're passionate about. Oh, I wish I wish I did, but I don't. But what a great what a great way to end something like that. I wish I had something. Perhaps prepared. I should have I should have prepared you, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> in, in conclusion, folks, we talked at the top of the show about the beautiful things that uh, we uh, humankind have developed in life, and I, I just want to I just want to share a couple more so that this should you know remain in your head. The human rights pro, uh, process, um, despite ongoing challenges, significant progress has been made in advancing human rights, including the abolition of slavery, although there are still slaves in the world, the establishment of equal rights for women and minorities, and the recognition of LGBTQ uh, plus rights. I mean, it's a magnificent thing. You know, had we been living 30, 40, 50 years ago, we, we were 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The rights were not for everybody, right, Linda? Absolutely. They Absolutely. were not, not for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Y yet there has been a stand in the world that we are going to try and develop a system that will inculcate the entire world whereby everybody has, has rights. As you were saying before, Linda, that everybody deserves compassion, everybody deserves to be loved, to be taken care of, and so on. Uh, the rapid technological advancements global efforts to combat climate change, and the list goes on and on. I think, uh, folks, fellow human beings, we have to embrace the beauty uh, that we have in our world and the beauty that we have within. And when we do that, we'll recognize it in others as well. So please do that. When you listen to this interview, take away from Linda the bravery, the courage that she had, really to uncover her roots. That's not always easy to approach your father about it, who did not want to talk about it. And ultimately, he didn't. But it took bravery, I'm sure, to even try. And just to emulate the beautiful world, the beautiful life that she has developed. So, Linda, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I love this conversation. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. I loved it, too. And, and I'm just so proud of you as a fellow human being. Thank you oh, for doing thank what you've you. done. Thank you so much. All right, folks, uh, till we meet again, we have some great shows coming up, and I look forward to being with you. Uh, it's, uh, this is being recorded right before the holiday of Shavuot. So Chag Sameach, have a good holiday if you are watching it prior to, to that holiday. And uh, just, just remember to emulate the beauty that so many people uh, show us and to bring it into your own life. Thank you so much.